We're going to be talking about speech communication over video conference links and Zoom in particular. So that's that's quite kind of ironic and amusing. Um, let me just go to the next slide and then see. There we go. Okay. So what I want to talk about is COVID and the effect it had on personal communications and in particular the effect of face masks on that. Then uh, remote working and communication like Teams and Zoom and um, why or why not that doesn't work. Um, I then want to look at maybe some of the components, the actual uh, Zoom transmission link and mics and headsets. And also remote measurement, uh, remote, remote acoustic measurement. I had to devise a way of actually testing some systems where I couldn't get to because of COVID um, and then afterwards for other reasons. But in fact, the, the techniques I developed worked really well. And in fact, I'm still using them now rather than flying um, around the world. I'm actually doing it from, from my office, which, which is great. Um, so a little about me. Um, I have some research interests in uh, really communications, audio and speech intelligibility. I mean, I started off as an acoustic consultant, so I still design rooms. But um, the last uh, 20 years, in fact, has many been audio, but with some acoustics in involved. Um, and I, I'm interested in particular in, in, in intelligibility, uh, as I say, but I also work in large rooms. I seem to have got a sort of reputation or a, a following for doing large room acoustics. Um, so I get involved with those. We'll see them later on. Um, I'm now semi-retired, but I have a fairly comprehensive lab in my office, so I can test most audio things um, and a lot of acoustic things as well. So obviously more the electronic measurements. I also have um, head and torso simulators and headphone measuring equipment, as well as all the electronic gear. So we can do all of that and you'll see some of that later on. So let's have a look at effective communication and face masks in particular. And I think most people noticed that speech was more difficult to hear and understand when we have people were wearing face masks. Um, I was looking at this out of interest during COVID, um, particularly because I had a, a friend of mine who's profoundly deaf and he was suffering con considerably and I was interested as to why. So that's really what's got me started. Um, so I carried out a load of measurements on face masks and communication systems. And I found that the harder hearing in particular and the hearing impaired were um, disproportionately affected. And I was so interested as to why that would be. And partly that was because of lip reading. If once you start to lose hearing, in fact, we all do it every day anyway, we all lip read to some extent or other. But once you've lost hearing, you really do lip read. And of course, face masks stop you from doing that. And the effect is really dramatic and it shows how much we do or they uh, lip read. So that was really the, one of the major causes. And I'll have a look at some facts on that. Before I get too involved, I wanted to look at speech and speech intelligibility. And I'm going to do some background just to bring everybody up to, to speed. Um, the main this isn't actually doing what it's supposed to do. Ah, let's try that. Um, so the main speech area of interest is from 100 to 8 kilohertz. You'll often see this diagram actually a lot cutting off at 4, 5 or 6 kilohertz, but it really goes up to 8 without any problem. Um, so we're interested really in the 100 hertz to 8 kilohertz of speech. Um, although speech, the signal goes well beyond 8 kilohertz, but there's not much more information to be gained from it. Maybe some quality, um, and a lot of people can't really hear that because it's so far down anyway. And if we look at the typical speech spectrum, you can see um, the, the main area of, it, of, of speech is sort of 250 to 500 hertz. And then it drops off fairly linearly, uh, about five, 4 or 5 dB per octave. Um, in fact, when you look at it. And here is some real speech, and you can see that it varies considerably. It goes well beyond, there's the eight kilohertz mark. So you can see there's a lot of information. And these are just uh, four or five different voices going well beyond up to 16 kilohertz 
for example. This one was a recording, so it finishes earlier. And the, the, the low end finishes, and it drops off in most cases. And in fact, what we can do is take an average of that. And um, there's a standard, we, we use the ISO standard, um, IEC 26816, which is the speech intelligibility standard using the sound transmission index. And that, in fact, has this characteristic that the, the spectrum it uses. It used to use this one up here, but in fact, when we look at real speech and compared it to a lot of other studies, uh, it was decided to, to reduce the um, low frequency content to bring it into line. And then some real speech. And you can see here, here's a spectrograph. Um, and you can see there's the 16 kilohertz line. I hope you can see that. And in fact, it's peaking above that. So this is real speech uh, with a measurement microphone straight in, and it's going well beyond 16 kilohertz. Uh, and you can see the, the, the time waveform, but I'm interested really here in the spectrum. And so you can see there's a lot of energy down here at 250 hertz uh, to 500 hertz in the vowel region. And then as you go up into the consonants, the, the levels drop um, at four kilohertz, as we saw in that previous slope. And in fact, here's some, some real speech looking at it a different way, but this is in fact taken over Zoom. Um, so there's the time waveform at the top, and this is the spectrograph uh, using Zoom. And you can see I've put 12 kilohertz in there because Zoom will normally go to 12 kilohertz bandwidth. You can extend it up to 20 kilohertz, and we'll look at that a bit later. Um, if you're using Teams, then they restrict it to 8 kilohertz, and we're going to see that a bit later on as well. But Zoom gets to 12. Whether there's a benefit is, um, of, I don't know, I've, I've yet to be convinced, but why not have it if it's there um, for certain? Okay, now speech is quite a delicate. There's, there's just three, that's actually A, E, and S. And you can see the S, and they go way down in level. Um, at, at the higher frequencies, it's really way down. And in fact, well, let's, let's, I'm going to bypass it to, to make up some time. Um, now, if we look at the contributions to intelligibility, it's quite interesting that if you take normal speech, i.e. sentences, you actually have a different weighting to if you're using, for example, fit, I'm going to say phonetically, but it's phonemically balanced words or just words on their own. Um, they all have a, a, an input here at about 2 kilohertz. I mean, that is the most important region from about 1 to 4 kilohertz. Um, but you can see here with real sentences, real speech, there's a lot more uh, information actually down here at 500 hertz, 400 hertz, which comes as a bit of a surprise because we've all kind of learned that it's the 2 kilohertz that's the important bit. Now, converting that to an octave band contribution, um, and I've done that for a reason. It just shows it slightly differently, but you can see here how the 500 hertz pokes up. Uh, the 2 kilohertz is important, um, obviously, uh, to speak, but it's more there for, for words, and at 500, words on their own do not have the same thing. I don't know why that is. I mean, somebody who studies speech maybe could tell me, but I, I, I just take it because I know where this came from, and I believe them. If we now uh, look at that in terms of uh, STI graph, um, you can see now I'm comparing sentences here with the STI thing. And in fact, that you know, one, two, and four kilohertz, they're very similar, you know, very similar weightings, uh, which is effectively what's on the left scale. At eight kilohertz, um, STI actually takes more interest and it is more aware. And at 250 uh, hertz, they're about the same. Um, and there's some information at one, two, five. But that, so that's the STI uh, weighting plot there at, uh, in the blue. And it's worth just trying to, if you can remember that for later on, it's helpful. And just to look at a different way of looking at the frequency response, if we take this um, the speech curve in particular, and it's a banana, so if we invert it and actually look at hearing loss. But the important thing to remember here <clears throat> to see is that the F and the sounds, which are really important to sort out various words, are all up here at sort of six kilohertz uh, in that region. And they're very weak. So anyway, these are strong sounds. So these are all the vowels that have got a lot of energy. 
up here is a really weak sound and it's at a higher frequency. So if we're going to have intelligibility, we've got to be able to get these higher frequencies through and they've got to be able to get these weaker sounds through. And as we're going to see later on, maybe that does or doesn't happen and various um, ideas are put into place to try and improve that. So to quickly summarize on that, uh, the main speech is from 100 to 8 kilohertz, 100 hertz to 8 kilohertz, um, although the speech signal goes well beyond 16 kilohertz. Uh, if you measure it, but it's way down, but it's there. The main intelligibility region is one to four kilohertz. If you think telephone bandwidth was from 300 hertz to 3.3 kilohertz, um, and that covers the main intelligibility area, but you can still confuse words, but you rem generally you get that from the meaning of the sentence, but occasionally there is word confusion. As, and as I said, the F, S, and K sounds, or the uh, require, you know, wide bandwidth. They need at least six kilohertz to get those sounds through. So the eight kilohertz bandwidth of teams is, is absolutely fine and adequate. And in fact, eight kilohertz is used by a lot of communication standards um, as being, you know, absolutely fine. Some standards use four kilohertz, but eight is, is generally uh, one of the main ones. And in Western languages, it's the vowels that carry the, the weight and the volume of the sound, and it's the consonants in the higher frequency region that actually have the intelligibility. But it's a combination of the two, it's not just one or the other. And loss of hearing with age, presbycusis, um, that's a loss of high frequency. So that's why older people and the hard of hearing are at a disadvantage because they're losing those high frequencies already. And if the transmission system further attenuates them, then they're in dire straits. Um, but not all hard of hearing and hearing impaired suffer from a, an HF loss. There's an inverse um, slope. Um, so it's not just that. The other thing to remember, and I think most people don't realize this, is that hearing aids do not restore full hearing. You'll get about 50% back at best. So just because you've got a hearing aid doesn't mean to say you're hearing as clearly as anybody else. You are most certainly not. You are still at a disadvantage if you have a hearing aid. Um, and, and that's really important for people to understand. And so really the harder hearing um, and the hearing impaired, they struggle for every dB. Every dB makes a difference um, because intelligibility is a highly nonlinear function. And sometimes just one or two dB can take you over the curve and suddenly you can understand something which you couldn't before. So literally every dB is important and we mustn't throw them away. So let's look at the effect of face masks. I'm just going to disappear because I need to plug my computer in because um, I've swapped. And hopefully I'll always need it. Right, so if you look at the effect of face masks, obviously everybody was wearing them all around the world. Sometimes they made their own, sometimes they bought them. Um, and in fact, they all have different properties, um, acoustically at least, and indeed in terms of spread of infection. Um, so I was interested, and because I was stuck in, at home in my office, my office is now next door, so I could easily get to it. It's a 30 second commute. Um, and I happened to have a head and torso simulator sitting there so I could actually test face masks. So I did. And in fact, you can see here. Uh, let me just change this. That's better. I can see what I'm doing now. Um, we actually measured, or I actually measured the attenuation that the face masks have. And it wasn't so surprising. You put a cough in front of your face and the high frequencies disappear. And that's what these measurements are showing. This is showing attenuation effectively. And if you have a light cloth uh, face mask, it could be a surgical mask or just a light cloth, it's this line up here. It's, it's taking two, three, four, or maybe five dB up at the higher frequencies off, which is not a massive amount, but it's significant for the harder hearing, and it's significant in terms of it's actually blocking the view. Um, the, the higher or the better me medical masks, you know, that, that we can more efficient in terms of infection control, they are heavy material, and in fact, they attenuate more. Um, there's five dB, and you can see now, uh, we're, we're losing 10 dB through these masks at 4 kilohertz. So that is a significant 
a significant loss of speech information and speech intelligibility information in particular. So it's really these high high medical masks that are are the, you know the problem, if you like. Um, other masks are a problem. They, they they certainly muffle the sound, which can affect certain people. Uh, but it's really the loss of sight and the lo loss of lip reading that is the real cause of the loss of intelligibility. Um, so you can see the fabric ones, yeah, from this region up to about a kilohertz, at least maybe two or three, two dB, and they depend. This one's hardly had any loss at all. This, these ones down here a bit more. And then it's about a kilohertz uh, in the transition zone. It doesn't really matter what the material is. They all seem to do about the same thing at about 1K, for you know, whatever reason. And obviously the hence, the denser, the denser and heavier fabrics attenuate more, typically 4 dB at 4K. And then the really dense ones are really losing it to up to 10 dB. And it's a very significant effect with a face mask, no question. Okay. And all of them, I'll say, they're all visually opaque. They all stop lip reading. Now, that became apparent. And so some people started to make clear masks. Um, you, you could buy a clear mask like this. Also, obviously, if you were wearing a visor rather than a mask, um, you could then see the lips and read. And that had a different set of properties. And then, in fact, in some cases, you actually had a medical mask and a visor uh, in, in certain situations. And we'll see what that does. So if we look at the plots now of attenuation, so I've got frequency up this way, up to 12K, and hopefully it's in 5 dB steps. What's interesting is that when you introduce a, a, a clear panel, either into a mask or in the visor, you get a resonance effect. And they're all about the same. I mean, these are, these are four or five different masks of different types. And they're all having these resonance around about 800 to 1K, maybe up to 1200, uh, introduced by the plastic of the visor or the material. Um, so that just summarizes it. There's the areas of the face mask. There is the visor. Um, and it's really quite a pronounced peak. And this, this is for that visor there. And if you add a mask and a visor, then you're really into deep problems. I mean, you're losing at least 10 dB, even with a light surgical mask. I mean, that is a, an, an effect on intelligibility. Now, there were lots of studies done. And it was a very easy student project to measure uh, the attenuation through a mask. Virtually nobody measured the effect actually on the intelligibility. They all went, oh, well, it's loss of high frequencies. You know, yes, it's going to affect it, but nobody actually quantified it. And that's one of the things that I did, which is slightly unique. So there was one study I've seen that actually did do some intelligibility in some word scores, which is very useful. And it correlated very nicely with what I was doing. So there are a range of those clear masks that were made. I mean, all sorts of materials, homemade ones. These were commercial ones. Um, Amazon did incredibly well out of me during COVID, just buying masks. I also bought, uh, this was a prototype of a clear face mask, uh, which was, I got sent to look at because people started to hear that I was involved and in doing some work on this. And that's a test, you see there, the probe microphone actually at the mouth, seeing what goes on when you put a visor in front of your mouth. And that has some interesting um, effects actually. The ironic thing is that the clear masks actually, although they allow lip reading, they actually have far greater attenuation at the higher frequencies than uh, the cloth masks. So on the one hand, hopefully you win by being able to lip read, but actually they're taking the sound away uh, by quite a big degree. So it's an interesting uh, balance there between the two. The other thing is that, you know, we, we most of us doing the measurement use the hats or some sort of loud speaker or some sort of dummy head comparison thing. I mean, some of them were pretty uh, Heath Robinson and you really can't believe the results, but at least if you use a calibrated head, you, you, you can repeat the results and then what's going on. But it struck me that, um, you know, the plastic uh, of the head is very, very different a human head. I mean, the absorption coefficients, the impedance of that surface are totally different. 
And so I did some measurements just to see what happens with real heads. It happened to be mine. Um, and yeah, there was, a, there was a measurable difference and a, a repeatable difference. Um, in this case, uh, lower frequencies there in the hat didn't make much difference. The head actually had more attenuation, but at higher frequencies, the impedance of the head and the absorption of it effectively meant that it didn't absorb as much as you would expect if you measured it on a hat or a head and torso simulator. Uh, and there are some measurements here again with the Perspex uh, parallel mask. These are actually the visors. I like tested for three different types of visor. Um, and you can see here that with the head, a real head rather than the hat, it, you know, the resonance is still there, but it's actually stunted. It doesn't get to the same peak. It's damped. Um, quite a lot. So it does make a difference. And here's the measurement taken um, by somebody else in, in, in the States. And you can see here with a loudspeaker, in fact, in their case, it wasn't a proper hat, but it came out here. Um, you can see quite a big difference when they actually do it a human as opposed to, to a, a loudspeaker approach from an you know, electroacoustic approach. Um, so, yes, there was a difference between real people and the hats. Obviously, a uh, head and torso simulator can give you uh, a repeatable result and it's much easier to measure. Um, but it's worth noticing that actually maybe we're not quite measuring it in the right way and we're getting a, getting a different result. So one of the things I noticed with this shield was that I, for some reason I was measuring the level of the ears because when I was wearing this shield, I thought it sounded louder and indeed it does. And when you put the, uh, a probe mic in the ear, or in fact, in this case, we use the ear mic in the, the head and torso simulator, um, there's a bunch of different masks. Yeah, it doesn't make much difference. But with the perspex field mask, I was getting plus five to six dBA increase in speech level because of this mask. And so you have the ironic effect that now you can see the leap, the lips but it's being attenuated more and people are not speaking as loudly because they think they're speaking loudly because the sound of their ears is louder so it really is a, a strange combination of, of effects going on there um, i then did some work on some development of a clear mask to try and see if we could get you know the medical grade uh, capability out of a mask uh, you know, a proper professional one rather than just a bit of cloth with a perspex panel in it. And there were various prototypes, but this, in fact, was kind of the final prototype, if you like, using a clear uh, mask. This is a respirator type mask, so the air comes in there and exhaled through there. And I was playing around with different filter materials uh, to see acoustically if we could actually make things a bit better, because you can see here the attenuation. Is really quite substantial. I mean, that's the UK, it's 15 dB Dan. So you really are um, getting rid of the high frequency. So it's incredibly muffled when you sound, when you listen to this mask. So you really have to rely on lip reading. And we were trying various, these are com other commercial ones, we were looking at their filters and seeing what they did. But in fact, in this case, it did actually steam up. And that's the problem with any of these clear masks, they tend to fog up. Um, so in fact, you can only just about see the lips. So it again is re re reduction. And that is the big problem with these clear masks, is fogging up. Um, there's some work currently going on to look at that and see if we can improve the airflow and you can get some anti fogging anti uh, spray that, that stops the condensation. So there are some techniques. And I seriously wondered about putting a microphone or a loudspeaker in there to see if we can improve things as well. That's a, another story. Um, so this is the latest version. This is this is current. Um, it's not been released yet. It's undergoing medical trials. Um, and it starts off with an opaque mask that it's going to be easy to make. Then there's going to be the clear one. Uh, so we're looking at the, the filtering and acoustically the effect of that, if we can improve things a bit. But it does do a good feel. Um, the face and the airport will, will actually in fact, this has now received its medical certification. I don't know if I understand that it's, I've got what it's achieving, but it's, it's now okay by the NHS to use it. So can we now make it more friendly uh, for people? 
by you know the hard of hearing and just normal people actually. Um, so that's ongoing. And something I didn't expect to be sort of working on, I must admit. As I say, I, I also men measured the effect of intelligibility um, on what the effect was of, of the mask. And um, here, just a range of masks. And this was done in a very quiet 23 dBA room, but it's a very reflective room. It's not, I, it's not reverberant, but it's very reflective. And um, we measured, I measured the STI and I got 0.7 uh, with no mask. And you can see there were some reductions and some quite you know, these, these are statistically significant reductions. Some didn't have much effect at all. Others did. Um, so 0.75 with no mask, and they were going down to maybe 0.7. Now, for the harder hearing, it's agreed that you need at least 0.7 STI for them to be able to understand speech reasonably well. And 0.75 would be, you know, much better, but 0.7 is in the standard. So that's a kind of a, a marker. Now that's fine in the quiet. You would never have a room really that quiet when your people are talking and there's other things going on. And I was trying to simulate a, like a medical examination room or something like that. So I increased the noise level to NR50. And now the STI without the mask goes down to about 0.54, so quite a dramatic reduction. And now you can see that these masks really do have a dramatic effect on intelligibility. Um, we're down here in the what point four seven area. These masks basically it's unintelligible down here uh, with the STI. Um, so these are the heavier grade medical masks, for example. Um, these are some of the clear masks, uh, and that one's really bad. So under real or real more realistic conditions, the mask really did affect intelligibility. In fact. I've put a line here of, of 0.4, um, and now you can see that most of the mask really didn't get um, 0.4 being really the limit of, of intelligibility of communication. So they really had a severe effect on it. And, and this is with, I've put in 20 dB hearing loss, which is a mild hearing loss, but now we're right down to 0.4. So with a mild hearing loss and a mask and some background noise, you're absolutely stuffed. Now this curve, I added the effect of lip reading or a visual cue. Um, it, it's a bit contentious. It was a bit of sort of, you know, suck it and see and rule of thumb. There's not been that much work really looking at the effect of um, lip reading and visual communication or, you know, the visual side of communication because there's been no need um everybody refers to a paper back in 1957 there's only about two or three since then but they've not really looked at this particular problem but by having you know by putting in a very conservative estimate as to how much improvement you get if you see you know this situation has gone from what 0.35 i mean totally unintelligible to nearly 0.6 to really quite good intelligibility and in fact i could have added a bit more uh, for the effect of lip reading into that. We also did some experiments. I, I do some work with South Bank University and do quite a few lectures every year and we do some experiments and things. And so I took the opportunity, um, once we could meet again, we took some students and uh, in one of the rooms where you can change the reverberation time, we did this under various conditions, uh, we looked at the effect of a clear face mask. Um, here with, with a real talker, obviously. And what came out of this that I want to talk about is the effect if you, of the non-native listeners. So if you're not non-native, by non-native, i.e. you didn't grow up, you didn't have English as your first language um, or after the age of seven or thereabouts, even if you're fluent, you're still not going to pick up the English as well as the intelligibility. And it was a dramatic effect. You can see here for the non-native English speakers, although they're all fluent, it had a dramatic effect on the sentence intelligibility, um, which really was, I wasn't, I knew there may be a slight effect, I was not expecting such a huge effect. So it's not just the hard of hearing that masks affect, it affects you know, non-native uh, listeners as well, which was quite 
yeah, a new finding. Um, and we just looked at a few more. Here are clear masks. And in fact, we therefore looked at the effect of, um, you know, being able to see the lips. Did that have an effect? And in fact, we found a very strange psychoacoustic effect um, on that. It didn't really help that much. Um, and that's just the way we did the experiment. I mean, it was a pilot experiment, and that's what you do pilot experiments for. It was referring a little bit later that came through on that. So I just wanted to show you the effect on, on non native speakers or listeners. Now, also, obviously, wearing a mask um, affects communications, be they radio, PA assistant announcements, or also sort of radio. I mean, you know, typical fast food outlet, wearing a mask now. It becomes much more difficult to hear what she's saying because it's been muffled. The high frequencies have gone. It's often difficult anyway. Um, making a, a PA announcement with a mask totally muffled really screwed things up. And people with phone calls wearing a mask, again, all the high frequencies go and it becomes difficult to do that. So not surprising when you see what's going on. Um, this is a particular little case history that I was working on. Um, this is a communications mic. It goes, the system goes to 4 kilohertz. In fact, it goes to about 3.5 uh, because that's one of the standards 4 kilohertz cutoff. So you can see it there. But this microphone actually has got a very flat response, remarkably flat. And so I was measuring that not only on the hats, but also other ways as well as we're going to see. Um, and it struck me that. If you were to compensate, and this this particular one is used for medical uh, communications, between operating theatres, between staff, but also between uh, professors and lecturers um, in, in that communicating what they were doing. And also they're going to be wearing a mask all the time. So it was, can we improve on this um, anyway, you know, with COVID or without COVID? And then, you know, obviously we've just seen the effect of the attenuation at high frequencies. And in fact, by some degree mm, pokering and some mucking about, we're able to actually get the microphone response, put a 5 dB boost into it um, to help compensate for at least surgical masks. Uh, and that did bring about quite a big improvement. But you've still got this 3.5 kilohertz bandwidth, so you're not going to get the high frequencies, the F, the Ks, the sounds out of it. Um, but at least it did actually improve things. Uh, and so there was a case where let's take a product and see what you can do with it to improve matters. Let's have a look at um, working from home, hybrid meetings and video conferencing. Um, I'm assuming that masks weren't worn, but in fact, some cases they most certainly wear. Um, so it's a very complex transmission channel. You've got the computer, maybe processing the sound. You've got Zoom processing the signal or Teams and the two will interact. You also have other factors going on. The acoustic environment, room acoustics actually can make quite a big difference. Certainly noise. I and mean, most of these systems have got noise cancellation or noise attenuation built in. I mean, Zoom at the moment we're working on um, does exactly that. It is actually reducing uh, the noise that's being transmitted. Um, some of the microphones have also got automatic noise um, cancellation in them. Headphones have even got noise cancellation in them, depending on the signal that's going on. So you've then got the internet connection, which can do all sorts of weird things, and you've got the Zoom processing. So you've got this incredibly complicated uh, mix of things. Um, and I was interested that video conferencing is often reported to be fatiguing, and I was wondering if that's partly due to the audio and I suspect it may be and I'll show you some, some some of the measurements I did. I'm not saying this is the cause but it's just interesting that it's there. So for intelligible speech we need adequate audio bandwidth and frequency. Uh, response we need a lack of temporal distortions i.e. reflections. I mean local reflections can really colour the sound um, as well as reverberation. We want a good noise ratio and we want freedom of the from distortion, clipping, and spurious other audio artifacts. I mean, sometimes you'll hear warbling, you'll hear distortion, you'll hear the Darth Vader type sound, which is not good for intelligibility. And we want to get rid of impulsive sounds as well, and other nefarious sounds that, that, that come in. 
Uh, now, remember, that's the sort of average frequency, the average long-term average frequency response we would expect or sexual response we'd expect to see from speech. So if it differs much from that, then you know, there's clearly an effect going on. The first thing I did was early on during COVID was this was a Teams meeting, uh, this was a Zoom meeting actually, with uh, numerous participants. And I was really quite surprised at how even and how uh, over a very small range the, the voice levels were. They were obviously being held uh, there by Zoom and the computers they were using. Um, most of them, in fact, we are within 4 dB. And if you get people to talk on a computer or anything, you, there's a bigger range than 4 dB. Um, obviously, this one fell out um, and it didn't do as well for whatever reason. That was a, an outlier. Um, maybe, you know, whatever. And maybe they fell out of the, the um, threshold range that this works in. But so there is quite an even uh, level coming out. And that makes absolute sense. You want a nominal level to go across the internet. So you want an AGC, you need an automatic gain control in there to have a level uh, going through so that you don't drop into signal noise ratio problems, etc. That makes total sense. At that same meeting, here are all of those freak or spectral responses from the talkers involved. Um, and they follow a reasonable pattern. There are some male and females. You can see these were female talkers because they don't have the low frequency content that you would normally have. Um, so if we take just the male speakers, I would expect them to have a kind of a notionally drop off like this. It didn't when you average all the male speakers together. It was more lumpy and there was a much bigger attenuation down here. Um, and in fact, it's 10 dB lower than expected at about 4 kilohertz. So that's really quite a drop and quite a loss. Um, female speech here, this, this is an average of lots of female talkers, and you can see it follows that kind of curve. Um, and there, in fact, is one of the female speakers on the Zoom meeting. And again, at what, two, two and a half, 3K, there is a nearly a 10 dB loss of the high frequency information. So it was interesting that in a lot of meetings that I am um, involved with, I, I tend to listen to them. I, I'm not only listening to people, what they're saying, I'm listening to what the sound's like. And the number of times I got a, you know, an analyzer out while the meeting was on just to see what was going on. And it's usually a loss of high frequency that, that's the problem. And it's almost like wearing a face mask. But in most cases, it's a loss of high frequency that uh, goes on in these uh, Zoom and Teams uh, meetings. I've only looked at those two. And in fact, this is the spectrum for one male participant that was almost unintelligible. You know, the information above two kilohertz just wasn't there. It just died. And so all you got was this very muffled speech and you had to concentrate incredibly you know, strongly to make sure that you could hear what was being said. Um, it was very difficult. And therefore very fatiguing to do that. And yet that was really quite common. Um, this is an interesting one. This only happened a few weeks ago, uh, well, just before Christmas. Um, this was during uh, a meeting and this was a particular voice who I happen to know quite well. And it was incredibly bassy. As you can see here, if you look at the spectral response, there's an awful lot of bass there. Um, and it, you had to again concentrate because we, you know, the, the high frequencies are now 20 dB down on where they should be, really, or 10 to 15 down on where they should be, uh, with a differential there. Um, so I managed to analyze the data of oh, the, the voice in some detail because I was really quite intrigued as to why it was that bad. And the strange thing was the next day I had another meeting with this guy. It was the same computer. Sorry, it has a, there you can see the 8 kilohertz bandwidth. By the way, that's why that dropped, because uh, this was a Teams meeting. So it dropped there in 8 kilohertz. The next morning, I had an, another meeting with this guy. Um, he was in a different room and on a different internet connection, but the same computer, same voice. And um, it was really quite surprising. And there's the blue one from there. And now the next day, look at this spectrum, completely different. 
there's you know this is a 10 db difference suddenly that's been made up um whether it was the room whether it was the internet connection i don't know but i shouldn't you know, like to be paying attention to a meeting but um it really was interesting this is the same voice um quite different between those two situations and in fact the um and you can see here a, 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 a spectrograph of the two, and you see how it, it drops there, and there, there is quite a difference. I think it's easier though to see a normal one like that, but it's good to see the detail in some of these and see how that has dropped dramatically. And it stops dead here at eight kilohertz in both cases, because that's the bandwidth of, of teams. And in fact, if you look at the spectrogram of so that particular, those two cases, the top one is the really bassy one, and you can see there's a lot of low mid frequency energy, sort of 250 to 300 to 400 hertz. And you can see the, the cut off here at 8 kilohertz of teams. And this is the next day. Now there's nothing like as much uh, lower mid frequencies that were really masking the sound, and a lot more higher frequencies getting through. You can analyze this a lot more, but, but it. it it's a very clear case of a change there. Uh, now, some microphones in computers and headsets try and overcome these high frequency losses by boosting the high frequency in the microphone. I mean, now, interestingly, this this was a um, microphone made for gaming, and it said it had a response from 100 to 10 kilohertz. Well, yeah, over a 45 dB range it does, um, but you can see this real big boost at High frequencies, that's sort of four or five k here, and they're rolled off at the really low frequencies. So yes, it would aid communication, um, and if you had a good connection, it sounds pretty shrill and not very nice. And in fact, this is a case of that. This was a female voice, and it, that spectrum is far too flat. So obviously there was some compensation going on either in the computer mic or the headset mic she was running. I can't remember. Um, and it sounded really shrill and very annoying, or at least to my ears, and therefore very fatiguing. I mean, listening to this voice was incredibly fatiguing and annoying. So, another good idea. And then there, here was another case of the low frequencies from another correspondent in that meeting where there was no high frequency. So, the two extremes. Um, I measured my laptop because I was interested, and this is the loudspeaker in my laptop. It drops off to 200 hertz, and, and it emphasizes up at the sort of five, four, five, six kilohertz region. So it's designed for communication, you know, designed for meetings and things, but it does sound pretty shrill. And depending what you're doing with it, um, yes, it's okay. It's, it's okay for voice meetings but that's all you want to do with it you certainly don't want to listen to music through it or decent material and that was the microphone on my laptop um, and again it's got a boost um, you've got to remove some of these dips here because that's due to reflection off the keyboard into the microphone um, but the overall response is doing that so it, it, it's boosted there and if you've got something on the other end with a similar computer and your computer is giving a high frequency boost on your receiving end, it really does start to sound very strident. And again, pretty fatiguing, certainly to my ears, as to what's going on. Um, now, I ended up testing a lot of headsets for various reasons. And you can measure them to a certain extent using a head and torso simulator. But the mouth isn't that well calibrated, and in fact, they only go to about five or six kilohertz if you're lucky, because uh, these things were designed for doing telecoms measurements, not uh, you know the current crop of things. So we ended up using a little speaker. It's very difficult to toughen that, but you can see by the size of the microphone, this is like a two-inch loudspeaker, and with some DSP, we can get an incredibly flat response out of the loudspeaker so we know what goes into the microphone is absolutely dead flat um, i also measured the, um, the headset side the earphone side although you can do it on the hats this is a more modern and this this meets 
the current regulations or the current standards, I can say, for measuring headphones. And so I use that. Um, and I, it, it gives you a better result, an understandable result. That was a headset uh, with a microphone. Look at the boost here at 5K, it's nearly 10 dB. Um, but by having the microphone close to your mouth, you know, in this position, you're going to get at least 20 dB improvement in signal to noise ratio over a computer mic that's maybe three, four hundred, five hundred millimeters away from your voice, from your mouth. So it's really important. Um, this was a surprise. When I measured the digital output of my laptop, it's dead flat. But if you actually plug in into the headphone output, it also has these two great big notches in the response. No idea why, why they're there. And again, that sort of screws things up. Um, I have no idea why anybody in their right mind would produce a response like that, but there you go. Um, so here are some other headset measurements and headphone measurements if you're wearing a headset or headphones when you're listening. This is quite a good, um, this isn't design, this is a good, you know, high quality headphone. And so we would expect to see a bass boost about 5 dB. That's absolutely what people want. It's not a bad high frequency response, a couple of peaks, but actually that's a pretty good headset and sounds very nice. This one, there is absolutely no information above four kilohertz coming out of the headset. Um, just dies the death. This one over here, again, was a, a popular uh headset or headphone that was used for video conferencing and other similar meetings and um again we've got a nice bass boost so it, it sounds quite warm but also you lose the high frequencies and then you suddenly get this peak at five kilohertz which um i find really annoying um, whether it helps intelligence, I don't know. But again, I found over a long period of time this headset was really quite fatiguing. Yeah, you know, for those reasons, lots of really useful information and then a sudden boost. Now, this headset, the blue one, I couldn't believe when I made it. I had to repeat it several times to make sure I got it right. I mean, there is nearly a 30 dB boost at three kilohertz in this thing. It is a communications headset. Um, and when I say that, it is designed for people to critically listen to what is coming uh, to them, their audio signal. It's incredibly fatiguing. It's, it's horrible. It really is horrible. And it's a lot of money. And as a reference, this is a really good hi-fi quality headphone. I mean, that's really what you're looking for. Maybe a little bit of more high, low frequency boost, but that's what we really want. Um, not so good for communication work and for listening and for intelligibility, absolutely not. But it's a really good quality, so it shows you where you are. So, yeah. So, depending on the headset you're wearing or headphones you're wearing, you know, you're going to get a completely different view on an audio conferencing uh, meeting. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm running a little bit late because we started late and I'm, I'm going to try and finish. Um, I don't know if what happens up after an hour if we get cut off or what. Just to try and finish this up, this was another headset microphone. This was a very strange one. It, it finished at eight kilohertz, basically, although there was information then carried on again at high frequencies. But basically what happened was the high frequency information above eight kilohertz arrived four milliseconds after the main sound, just due to the processing. Very strange. How, whether that's an audible effect or not, I don't know, but it's odd. Um, but you put it through a zoom link and it all changes. And that was a 12 kilohertz notionally, well, notional zoom link. In fact, it's, it's reduced it down. So now you've got a combination of zoom and the roll off of the microphone. Um, I actually measured zoom links just to see what they were doing. And it's incredibly complicated because obviously there's noise cancelling involved. And as soon as you put anything that isn't speech down the line, it will cancel it and it will cancel it in milliseconds. Um, so I had to develop a whole new technique for doing that. I, I haven't got time to go into that now, but in fact, we could do that. And you can see in this case, there's a 12 kilohertz bandwidth on a standard Zoom um, 
panel with noise cancelling involved. Um, if you try and measure it with a sweep, then you end up with all sorts of things going on. In fact, that's really the next slide. Um, if you put Zoom into its um, original sound or musician mode, it goes out to sort of 18, 19 kilohertz without any problem and reasonably flat. I mean, yeah, there's a little bit of change, but it's, it's pretty flat. You can see here, you know, 98 kilohertz, it sort of looks at the signal and goes, oh, there's more stuff at 8 kilohertz. I'll, I'll let it through, um, but I will change it slightly. Um, so, yeah, I was trying to see if can I use Zoom to actually do measurements with, and the answer is mm, not really, because it depends on internet connections and many other things going on. There's just a summary of some microphones and some headset measurements into most of those. But again, all I'm saying is that every microphone is different, every headset is different, so what you hear and what you get it can be very, very different. Um, this was a measurement I made in um, the middle of last year, and it's a pretty expensive headset mic, it's 180 pounds over here in the UK, and it's a very nice uh, headset. It's a really nice headphone response, that's kind of really what we want, it's pretty much the ideal. Um, the microphone has got noise cancelling in it, though. So if you do a normal measurement, it has these great big notches in it, uh, which is not very good, and it changes. Every time you do a sweep, you get a different result. Um, so again, using a technique uh, to overcome that, uh, th this is in fact the real response of that microphone. It's flat for the five kilohertz, then it slowly boosts up, and it sounds very good. So that's a really nice headset, so maybe it's a case of you get what you pay for. Um, it's also got this boost here, so that if you put it at the side of your mouth, this is measured on axis, which is not how you would use it. If you measure it at the side of the mouth, it actually is compensating, and it's got a pretty flat response, uh, or it's got a slightly boosted response. Um, so yeah, works really quite well. This is a Teams meeting uh, with dubious quality. Here are two different talkers. Um, this guy, it was break up the whole time um you had to struggle to hear what was going on and this is why all the high frequency information just kept on disappearing and dropping out and um, although it's below frequency all the vowels were there they weren't really affected very much um but the high frequencies were, were going and um, this is same meeting literally a few seconds later different talker and now you can see all the information is there um it was a team's meeting so there's an eight kilohertz uh, bandwidth on it but that's just the difference between good and bad audio via Teams. And there's some further analysis, which I'm going to skip through. I'm going to skip through that very quickly, just go on to acoustics. One of the effects of COVID was obviously social distancing and spacing. This is a cathedral, and that was a normal layout of speaking before COVID. That was after COVID. Um, you know, a fraction of the number of seats, different types of seats as well. So it didn't break up the sound anything like as much and a far smaller congregation. And so this cathedral sounded much more reverberant, you know, during the kind of the after COVID period. Um, and therefore the sound system actually had to struggle or struggle a bit more because it was so much more reverberant than, than had it been previously. It worked okay. But it was interesting that you really could hear the difference with those seats taken out and these uh, other chairs put in. Um, this is an obvious one where, my gosh, what a difference that COVID made. Um, this is Mecca and there's uh, the Kaaba. And this is throwing you with people the whole time. And you can see after, you know, during COVID, nobody. Um, and so acoustically, this is a huge difference. And then they allowed some people in. Bearing in mind that Mecca can accommodate, oh, over a million people. I think it's about 1.2 normally. So huge amount of absorption turns up every so often and just absorbs the sound wonderfully and works well. I wanted to do some remote testing and this was a concert hall system that I had to get involved with and measure. I couldn't fly there. Um, so I devised a way of doing it remotely using a measurement mic and a pair of cardioids, space cardioids, um, different ways of doing it, different mics. 
And in fact, we can get the measurements out quite nicely. There's the frequency response. There's the average response, which is exactly where we need to see absolute textbook pasted really nicely. Um, found that there was a big base bone resonance in the mixed position uh, in the control room, which is and then the balcony was very similar. And in fact, depending on how you measure it, that actually is a flat response. Although it looks like there's a slope, there is a slope, um, depending on how you measure it. So if you measure it with a real-time analyzer, that's what you'd expect to see. That's absolutely correct. If you measure it with a different technique, it's actually a flat response out to 15 kilohertz. And there are the other measurements in the stalls and other areas. What was interesting was listening to this remotely, I could hear in certain seats some problems. And also I can measure the FBI, for example, and other parameters um, from those measurements. In this, there was one particular seat that I, I really heard it was not as good, it was much more reverberant, not as intelligible. You compared it to uh, you know, reason adjacent seats, the measurements were very similar in terms of frequency response. If you measure the STI, there is actually a 0.1 difference in terms of the modulation transfer index. So you can see here the difference. Um, that is a big difference in potential intelligibility and showed why I was hearing what I was doing. And also I can measure the direct reverberation ratio, again, totally tied in with what I was listening to. And I was interested that an omni mic, an omni measurement mic worked really well. In fact, in some cases better than a the cardioid mic because the cardioid has to be really good for this to work um, and we then found there were some other things so remote testing i'm working for more on that maybe we do binaural but actually omni mic and omni measurement mic works really well and the reason i'm involved interested now in that is that i'm working on this project which is a huge mosque you see inside um, i'm not even allowed in so i would never be able to do the measurements myself anyway um, I've been in the basement, I've been on the outside, and I've been in the basement and listened to things going on, but it's not the same as listening to it. So frankly, I might have been several thousand miles away and, and listen in um, to what's going on. Doing that. So that's where I am. So I'm sorry that's gone a bit longer than I expected um, due to... Um, so we had some interesting issues to start with. I'll try and go through some questions. Um, Luckily, everybody seems they can hear. Um, that's good. That's what you were saying, really. Um, but the chat is disabled, but I can see it, so I'm not quite sure what's going on here. Um, okay, so thanks. I'm, I hope you got something out of that. Um, I'm not sure why the chat is disabled because I'm. Oh, I see it's in. Oh, that's interesting. I was looking in Q and A. Don't see why. If not, at the end, let me just go through to the end of this and, uh, oh, what's going on there? It's going to start. If you would like to email me, you can probably get me by, you can, but actually here is my email address. It's just peter at petermap.com. If you've got some questions, then please email me and I'll try and get back to you on them. Uh, apologies for the well, actually, it was it was okay leaving me, as they say. It was, it was some issues elsewhere, which caused caused some problems. Um, so I've had to swap computers and headsets and all, all the rest. But hopefully, you got something out of that. Let me know. And thank you very much for attending and being involved. Um, I think that's all I can do at the moment. Uh, I don't know why the chat isn't working. That's interesting. Well, as far as I know, it should be. Um, so don't understand that. It's clicked for everybody. Um, maybe Q and A. Um, yeah, sorry, Alex. Uh, the graph of the attenuation performance of the visor with them out the mask. Yeah. Um, well, all the visors, as I say, have this big peak at about 1k to 1200 hertz um, if you put a mask on then the two combine obviously um, they interact they're not directly additive but interesting um, so hopefully 
uh, gives you an idea. We, we can look into more into that. But um, again, it depends exactly on how you measure it, whether you measure it with a human head or whether you measure it on a hat and exactly the mask and exactly the, the visor you use. Um, you know, so you can do, all I can do is give you an indication as to what's going on rather than, um, you know, these are not absolute measurements. Um, yeah. Okay, I think that's actually answered most of the questions. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, would I introduce, sorry, thanks, Steve. Would I suggest that international companies buy and standardize a laptop? Um, yeah, and a USB headset. Yes, and in fact, one of, some of the measurements I did on those headsets was exactly for that reason. Uh, so there was a, an organization that wanted to try and standardize. They standardized on one of the earlier measurement headsets I measured, and it wasn't really very good. They have now tried to standardize on that expensive one I showed you because it really is very nice. I mean, it sounds good when you're listening to a good uh, input, and the microphone's working well. Um, obviously, it's more expensive, but I think you get what you pay for. So, um, yeah, they are standardizing on it. Whether they're going to standardize on laptops or not, that's a really interesting question. And maybe they should, because I mean, laptops aren't that expensive these days. And if it's important to get the information during a meeting through, um, actually, you know, why not? Okay. I guess 